Hello everyone, welcome back and in today's video we are going to be solving a few problems from magnetism and EMI. Okay, so this is the first problem. So we have a uniform conducting ring whose mass is pi kgs and it is kept on a smooth horizontal table and we have a uniform but time varying magnetic field that is present in the region. Okay, and this is the magnetic field. It is I cap plus T square J cap and the electrical resistance of the ring is given to be 2 ohm. So in the first option they are claiming the ring starts toppling at some particular time. So we have to first calculate that particular time. Okay. Okay guys, so this is how the situation is looking like. So the magnetic field is given as I cap plus T square J cap. Okay, so now the magnetic flux through the loop is simply B vector dot A vector. So the B will have two components, one in the X, Y, one in the X direction and one in the J direction. So obviously we'll have to pick the J direction because that's the direction of the area vector. So the magnetic flux is simply going to be T squared, which is a magnetic field times the area which is pi r squared. Now according to Faraday's law of EMI, a changing magnetic flux through a loop induces an EMF in the loop and that EMF induced we can write, a, write it as the rate of change of magnetic flux through the loop. So this comes out to be, so now if you differentiate it, it comes out to be 2 pi t volts. Okay. Now as an EMF is induced in the loop, some current will start circulating in the loop and now the question is in which direction. So if I look at it from the top, okay, so we can easily see that the uh, flux increases in this particular direction, which means the induced current should be such that it should create magnetic field that opposes, opposes the already increasing flux, which basically means if you look at it from the top, the induced current will be in the clockwise sense. Okay. So now as the current is circulating through the loop, power is being dissipated through, through the resistor and that instantaneous power dissipated is simply E square divided by R. So the total heat evolved, let's call it as delta Q, is simply the integral of PDT. We know the instantaneous power as a function of time. So, but we still want to know the time at which toppling will begin. Okay. Okay guys. So for finding out, you know, the moment at which toppling would begin, we have to first do some torque analysis. Now as current is circulating in the clockwise sense, as viewed from here, the magnetic moment vector current is circulating in this direction so if you curl your fingers guys in the direction of the current you'll get the direction of the magnetic moment vector so now i can easily write the magnetic moment vector it is simply in magnitude it is simply i times a so now the current is some simply the emf divided by the resistance resistance itself is 2 ohm so the current is simply pi t and the area is simply pi r squared now r is one meter so, so this comes out to be minus pi square t J cap. So now the magnetic moment vector is I into A. Now I itself is EMF divided by resistance and the area is simply pi r squared and after solving you'll get the magnetic moment vector as minus pi square t J cap. Okay guys now the thing is the magnetic field is has an I component and a J component. So the torque due to this magnetic field is simply M cross B. If you do M cross B uh, as you guys can see the, the cross product is minus J cap cross I cap. The J cross J would be zero. Minus J cross I is in the K cap direction and the K cap direction if you guys observe is is in this particular direction. So the torque actually the torque due to magnetic field comes out to be in this particular direction. So the loop will actually start turning about this particular axis. Okay. Okay guys. So now when the loop is just about to topple, the normal reaction completely shifts to this particular corner and we have the weight of the loop acting at the center mg. So this is the force profile and then we have the tau due to magnetic field tau b uh, tau due to the magnetic field. Now the thing is guys this torque due to magnetic field is formed as a result of couples. So what I'm trying to say is if you take a small current element dl vector, the force that this current element experiences is I dl cross B, right? Now, if you take a symmetrical current element on the other side, this uh, in this case, dl is just reversed now, right? So which means this guy experiences a force of minus I dl cross R. The forces on these two current elements, they actually form a couple. And whenever we have couple forces, the torque due to them is axis independent. This is something that we learn in mechanics. As it is axis independent, I can keep it about this axis, keep it about the center, keep it about whatever axis you want. So let's just do it about this axis because we don't want to consider the normal. So from here we can see that. So toppling would occur when the magnetic torque becomes greater than the torque due to mg. So the magnetic torque we just, okay, we didn't calculate it. So this comes out to be pi t square t, the magnetic field, which is one in the k cap direction. So this is the magnetic torque. So if pi square t becomes greater than the torque of mg about our axis O is nothing but mg into R. Okay, so the moment when t becomes greater than mg upon pi square numerically is 3.18 seconds, ring will start to topple. And for the second problem, for the heat calculation, it is simply integral of the 
power is e square by r guys so e square is 4 pi square t square divided by 2 it is 2 pi square t square and you have to integrate it from 0 to 3.18 seconds using integral e square by r dt and you just have to put the time till t equal to t toppling and from that you'll get the heat dissipated as 0 0.21 kilojoules okay so this was the first problem so now let's move on to the second problem okay guys so now moving on to the next problem so in this question we have a point positive charge q that is placed in an infinite viscous liquid the charge is thrown with some initial speed in the xy plane and it is observed that it comes to rest after some time now a uniform magnetic field okay so in the case one there is no magnetic field a point charge moving in a viscous medium that's it so the only force acting on the charge is minus bb now in the second case we have a magnetic field perpendicular to the plane of motion of the charge and the charge is again projected with some velocity the displacements in the two cases in the two cases are s1 and s2 the viscous forces due to the medium is minus bb where b is a constant and v is the velocity in this question there is a small typo guys the initial velocity of projection in both cases is the same so i think this sentence is actually charge is again projected with the same initial velocity okay keeping in mind that assumption try to solve this problem and then check out the solution okay guys so the in the first question they are asking the angle between the displacement vectors so first let's draw a diagram okay so we have a positive point charge uh, in the first case it's simply projected along the x-axis let's say so the projection velocity is v now guys, uh, we know that it's in a viscous medium, so the viscous drag of minus of BV acts opposite to the velocity vector. So now let's try to write down sigma F equals MA for this charged particle. The net force is simply minus BV and this would be equal to M dV by dt, okay? So now what we're going to do is guys, we're going to use a trick here. So whenever you see a force of minus BV guys, so always think about integrating it with respect to time. So what I'm going to do is take dt to the other side. So this becomes minus bp dt uh, equals m dv. So now I'm going to integrate on both sides. So the right side becomes m delta v and the left side becomes minus b times. Now guys, integral of, okay, now obviously guys, this is a vector equation. So vector v dt is nothing but the displacement of the particle, which is given to us as s1 vector. And the right hand side is simply m delta v, which is simply the change in momentum, uh, which is nothing but the delta p vector. Okay, so let's call this relation as relation number one. Okay, so now in the case two, when we project it with the velocity v, there's obviously going to be a bv opposite to the velocity vector. And let's say if the magnetic field is into the plane, uh, then the, then if you do qv cross b, which is the magnetic force, it will be in this direction. So anyways, it, it is going to be perpendicular to the velocity vector. So this is q times v cross v. Uh, now the particle is going to travel in along some curve, something like this, and, and this is going to be s2 vector. So now again we can apply you know the equation of motion so we can say m dv by dt equal to the net force which is nothing but qv cross b minus b v vector so now again i am gonna do the same integrating with time trick so this becomes m dv and this becomes q v cross b dt minus bv okay so now i'm gonna integrate it okay so now the left side similarly becomes delta p okay so this term again it's guys it's the integral of the velocity vector dt so this gives a displacement vector and the displacement vector in this case is s2 so this becomes minus b s2 vector and for this term what i'm going to do is i'm going to take the q out of the integral and i'm going to do integral v dt this thing cross b okay so what i did here is maintain the order of the cross product then i brought the dt inside and you know placed it with v and then i just integrated it and uh, i can do this because the only thing that's uh, varying with time is the velocity vector right so the magnetic field vector is simply a constant and it, and the proof of this is pretty easy all you have to do is open v cross v then here there will be an i cap j cap k cap component and only the vx vy vz terms are going to be integrated with respect to time integral vdt again transforms into s2 vector cross b minus b times of s2 vector so this would be a equation number two so from equation number one and two uh, what we can see if i equate equation one and two what i obtain is q times s2 cross b comes out to be equal to b times of 
S2 minus S1. So let's say this is S1 vector now, and let's say this is S2 vector. So they are saying S2 minus S1, which is going to be this vector over here, is Q by B times S2 cross B. Now the interesting thing here is guys, S2 cross B is perpendicular to S2, which means the situation will be something like this, where this vector is Q by B, times S2 cross B. So in, in magnitude, this is just going to be Q S2 B divided by small b. And the reason for that is S2 and B are perpendicular to each other, right? So now it's pretty simple there. They asked us this angle theta. So from here, we can see that sine theta is nothing but Q S2 B divided by B S1. Okay, so if you check the options, it matches with option C, which would be the answer in this case. Okay, so in the second question, they're asking us about the heat. Okay guys, so technically the heat is obviously because uh, there's a minus BV dissipating agent, right? We know that the magnetic field delivers no power, positive or negative, to the charged particle. So the only thing that is dissipative in nature here is the viscous drag. So the heat dissipated is nothing but the integral of minus BV, which is the viscous force dotted with the velocity. So this thing gives me the instantaneous power, right? I'm doing F dot V and this thing dt. So if I integrate this from zero to t stop, which is basically the time it took to stop, I'll get the answer for heat. Second case over here, the only force that is reducing the speed v is actually bv because qv cross b has no role in changing the magnitude of v, right? If you balance the forces along the tangential direction, the tangential acceleration is nothing but BV by M. Similarly, even in this case, the tangential acceleration is BV by M. So ta tangential deceleration is same in both of the cases. Initial speed is also the same, which means the velocity function will be identical for both of the cases. And secondly, the time to stop will also be identical, right? Because it's exactly the same function. So we can, we can even find out the velocity as a function of time. All you have to do is take V to the other side and integrate it'll be an exponential decay. So as the velocity and the time function and the time to stop are exactly identical, this integral will also come out to be identical. And therefore we can say that the heat evolved is going to be equal, which means option D would be the correct answer. So the that was the answer to this question. So now let's move on to the final problem. So in this question, we have a copper sphere who's uh, given a charge of plus Q. So, it, uh, so it'll distribute itself uniformly along its surface. Now the temperature of the sphere is increased by delta T. Linear expansion coefficient of copper is alpha. The specific heat capacity is S. Assume the size change is only due to the temperature. And so, and we have to talk something about the energy. Okay, so firstly, they're saying the size is increasing. So, okay, so let's say the radii of the copper sphere increased by an amount of delta R. Linear expansion coefficient is given to be alpha. I can easily write delta R as the original radius R alpha delta d okay so now the thing is they're talking about the potential electrostatic potential energy so the electrostatic potential energy of an isolated sphere on the surface of whom a q charge is spread is actually kq square divided by 2r so now the thing is the e dash which is the so the change in electrostatic energy now as the same charge is spread on a bigger sphere uh, we can see that as radius increases the self energy actually goes down so the potential energy is definitely going to decrease so it's going to be kq square by 2r minus kq square divided by 2 times of r plus delta r. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is take kq square by 2r outside 1 minus 1 plus delta r by r to the power minus 1. So now I'm going to uh, use binomial approximation here and approximate it to the first order term. So, so this will be 1 minus delta r by r. So effectively this entire thing will become delta r by r. So now if you put delta r equals r alpha delta t, uh, you get this as the answer, which corresponds to option A. Now in the second option, they're asking us about the total heat needed for this process. So the heat that we give to the system actually does two things, guys. So first it increases the internal energy of the system, meaning it increases the temperature. And secondly, changed the electrostatic potential energy. So the in increase in internal energy in order to increase the temperature of a solid by an amount of delta T, the energy that we need to provide it is going to be M S delta T and the electrostatic potential energy to actually decrease. So we have to put a minus sign here times Q square alpha delta T divided by eight by epsilon naught R. So this corresponds to option C. So our answer in this case is going to be A and C. So that was it for this video guys. If you enjoyed the video, do like, share and subscribe. And that's it. Thanks for watching.